We're starting a new series. It's called Agents of Hope. And I'm on a campaign. I'm recruiting. And I believe this is what God wants us to do. Every one of us, God wants you to become an agent of hope. Tell the person next to you, you want to be an agent of hope? Amen. You know, we live in a world that is hopeless, seeking for answers. And that's why we need to step up to the plate as the body of Christ, as God's people, to bring hope to this dying world. And here's the big idea. You know, every time I preach, I, I want to come a big idea because I'm ADD, so I need to focus and focus on that one topic and then allow the Holy Spirit to flow to the message. We study here book by book. That's why I said I ADD. I, I want to start book by book so I won't get distracted. I want to introduce you to a book that uh, I had the privilege of visiting the, the place Somewhere in the Mediterranean, in, 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 during the Paul's missionary trip, it's in Thessalonica. It's a short book, but it's full of hope. And it's only five chapters, 79 verses. And I challenge you, every Sunday, we're going to go chapter by chapter uh, uh, and word for word for this and study this. And so here's the big idea. Would you stand up on your feet today, Charisma, and let's all read this together. Apart from God. Every other hope we have in this world is ultimately, let's read it with church. Apart from God, every other hope that we have in this world is ultimately a dying hope. And all of God's people said, Amen. First of all, I just want to thank you, Charisma, for praying for your pastors. As we all know, last week, a few weeks ago, we went on a, on a cruise for our vacation. We went to St. Martin, to Puerto Rico, to Key West, to Miami, to Fort Lauderdale. And just the moment we left, it's after two days, the hurricane arrived. And we're just so thankful to God that uh, God spared us from that possible tragedy because I had connected some friends at the cruise ship. The next ship who, who, who uh, voyaged after us, until today, they're still in the middle of the ocean. They cannot go to, Saint, to Puerto Rico. They cannot go to Cuba. They cannot go to St. Martin. And they cannot go back to Florida right now. It's because being hit by hurricane. And we, I'm just telling you today, we're living in the last of the last days. This is very rare that you see earthquake and hurricane happens after another in a span of one week. And that tells us that this world is not secure. Amen, somebody. Amen. Apart from God, anything that you hope for is ultimately a dying hope. Let's pray first. Father, we pray for the people in Florida today, for the people in, in Houston, in the Caribbean, in Mexico, who suffer a devastating earthquake. We are living in times like this that everything is being shaken. And only God is not shaken. We ask you, Lord God, to bring life and hope and, and mercy upon those people who lost their lo loved ones, lost their families, or lost their belongings, Lord God. That help them to, to call on you, Lord, that you are a God who will give a chance to rise back up when everything is down to nothing. And God, I pray today as we start this series about agents of hope, fill us with hope so that we could sp spread hope to other people that need your hope. Not religion, but spread hope in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, I just want to start this off with this uh, three top books in business. Uh, if you go to Harvard, you go to NU University, this is a required reading assignment. The mindset, built to last, and good to great. They, they just surveyed the top companies in, in the world and study how they were built. And this is just amazing. How many of you have heard this saying, today's success is tomorrow's failure? 
let me give you an example. How many of you could still remember that quarterback who always uh, does that? Remember that? Is that the dubbing? Who's that quarterback? You forgot already, right? Cam Newton, right? He was successful a few years ago, and then last year, and that even make it to the playoffs. So it's just a reality that success today is not guaranteed tomorrow's success. Case in point, in the book, Good to Great, look at the next slide. Of 11 companies in Good to Great, nine are losing and flatlining already filed for bankruptcy. One company that they highlighted that is the most, the best company to work for, and this is a good company. Do you remember this company? Look at the next, next picture. Can we show it on the screen? How many remember Circuit City? <laughs> well, remember that Circuit City? Right? This, is, this was highlighted as the best company to work for. What I'm trying to say is this. There is no really guaranteed success that anything in this world could be up and down. Amen, somebody. You know why? Because there's a prophecy in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, 27 to 20. I want you to read this together, Charisma. One, two, three. The words once more plainly show that the created things will be what? Shaken and removed. So that the things that cannot be shaken will remain let us be thankful then because we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. come on somebody say amen to that and let us be grateful and worship God in a way that please him with reverence and awe the word once more indicate what's happening in the world right now everything that's created will be shaken there is no hurricane proof. There is no earthquake proof. There is no tsunami proof. Everything in this world will be shaken. And then God says, so that what cannot be shaken will remain. You know what cannot be shaken? God. Amen, somebody. Amen. Number two, his people. Come on, somebody. We might be shaken a little bit sometimes and worry, but every now and then we still go back up and go back up. Christians, you shoot them seven times, they'll go back up again. Come on, somebody. And the things that cannot be shaken is the church. Imagine that. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. So let's study the church. Because it's the church that God established that has been tested through the test of time. It's not a circuit city that you see now and then gone tomorrow. The book of 1 Thessalonica heads a beautiful story of this church. I want to show you the picture first, the background. You know, so we'll travel like in Mediterranean. You go there somewhere in Greece. There are a place called Macedonia there. That is where Thessalonica. i show you the modern day picture. The modern day picture is if we go to the next slide. Here is the picture, a beautiful port city. If you travel to the Mediterranean, you will see the Macedonia. That's where Paul went and preached. And check this out. This next picture is like the downtown. And then archaeologists dug up and they found another city underneath this downtown. It's the marketplace where Paul preached the word of God. How many of you know that downtown Seattle, there's another city underneath downtown Seattle? Have you been to the underground too, right? You see just the, the skyscraper, the Space Needle, but underneath that huge uh, building, there's a, another city before that was burned in 1900-something. So that this is the original place where Paul went, preached the garment, the gospel in the marketplace. What happened in Thessalonica? Sad story. Of all the places Apostle Paul went, this is the shortest visit. He only stayed there for three Sabbaths. Back in the day, uh, he always preached to the Jewish people, and they gather on Saturday during Sabbath, so that's why he goes during Sabbath. Only three Sabbaths, like 21 days. He did not stay there long because he was kicked out. Let's look at the next slide. Here's the background. 
Let's read this together. Acts chapter 17. They rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot. Would you imagine you're going to go to a certain city, you want to preach the gospel, and here comes the gangbangers, the thugs, and they gang up on you, and they want to kill you. And you know what the believers did in Thessalonica? As you go to the next slide, you will see this. As soon as it was dark, nighttime, they took Paul and sent Paul away to Berea. He was saying, Pastor Paul, it's not, it's not proper right now. You will get killed here. Imagine you go to a place, you want to plant a church and stay there for three weeks. Do you think the church will, will flourish? Chances are, chances are, will not stay, right? The pastor's only there for three weeks. But did you know, after Paul left Athens, the church grew and thrived. It tells us one important thing. The success of the church is not based on the pastor, it's based on the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. Went there three, three weeks and gone. But the church in Thessalonica became one of the best and the greatest churches back in the day. Look at the next slide with me here. This is what happened. So you will see a, a mental picture. He went there for three weeks. Paul forced to leave because of violent opposition. There was already mobs and riots back in the day. And now Paul's assistant, his son, was sent to Thessalonica to be the pastor. And then the church thrives. What's their secret? And I believe four marks of an agent of hope that we could learn from this first Thessalonican Christian. Number one is this. They were motivated by grace. Everybody say this with me. Motivated by grace. Can I ask you today, what moves you? What makes you awake at night and woke up early in the morning? What motivates you? If you would just say, I need to earn money, that's a good motivation, but shallow motivation. Because sometimes even though you have money, you'll still be sad and lonely in your life. Amen? What moves you? What, what's what's the, the thing that drives your engine? For Apostle Paul, what moves him is the grace of God. I want you to read this together with me. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in the God, the Father, and Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody say this with me. Grace. Everybody say grace. grace. How many of you need grace today? You know what's another word for grace? Favor. How many of you say, God. I need a favor from you. <laughs> Come on, somebody. So when you say grace, you're saying, God, I need a favor from you. And God, grace was upon Paul. Did you know he was a terrorist before? Paul killed Christians. And then God arrested him and he became a believer and he became a missionary. So he knows that's grace. So everything that he does in his life is because of the goodness of God in my life. I want to spread the goodness of God to other people. Now, let me be blunt to all of us Christians. It's easy to sing amazing grace. But the thing is, are you living out grace? You can hold hands here and sing amazing grace. And then when you go to the parking lot, when you drive, when somebody caught you, you gave that person the number one sign You yell at your husband, you yell at your wife, you yell at your kids. Let's not just sing amazing grace. Let us be gracious people. Amen. You know, when we were in the cruise, they found out I'm a pastor. So here, oh my gosh, here we go again. They started the, uh, confessing their sins to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, this, oh this, this newlywed from New Jersey, a <laughs> dude, and, uh, and they got uh, married and then took out the wedding ring right away. And then we, we were watching sunset and uh, my wife and I were there and then taking pictures of us because he's, uh, he likes to take pictures too. And I said, oh my gosh. Can you pray for me? Because you know, uh, I, I just had a quarrel with my wife. And then, and then after, after he was blurting all this problem, he comes to her and said, and I was telling him, oh yeah, and they started to deliver, sorry, because the wife is here. 
And then I would say, oh, you, I, 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 I praise the husband. You know what? You have an awesome husband. And then the, the lady said, yeah, he's very nice to other people, but mean to me. <laughs> and you know, sometimes that's true. We're very nice to other people, but the people inside our space were mean. That's why sometimes I have to ask forgiveness from my wife. I can give my best put forward in front of you because I'm a pastor. I am too blessed to be stressed. Hallelujah. God is good all the time. Bless you, brother. Peace. <laughs> Sometimes we're having a quarrel with my wife and then the cell phone rings. I don't know what to do. Hi, sister. God is good all the time. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Come on, share it. What was that? To the person that I should be gracious because I'll spend the rest of my life. I yell. Confession is good for the soul, bad for the reputation. <laughs> I don't care about my reputation right now. So let us not just sing it. Let's be gracious, amen? Especially the time we're living right now. Racial issue is so sensitive, things like that. Just respect people, love them then, and be gracious. Amen? Amen? And listen to what Paul says. We always thank God for all of you, continually mention you in our prayers. Remember before our God and Father, everybody say this, produce work, produce by faith, labor, prompted by love, endurance, spark. Please don't miss this. This is very important. This is life-changing. Your work must be based by faith. If what you, when you work for is out of obligation, oh, I need to go to church, my grandma is bugging me, I need to go to church, you will just get bored here. But if you, you come here, it's not a work, it's based by faith. I want to worship God. And when you labor, you're suffering, I do it because I love. Remember a pregnant woman going to the labor pain. There's a picture of labor of love, enduring that, that labor pain because there's a promise of hope of a baby. And here's what motivated the Christians there. The work produced by faith, the labor is prompted by love, and endurance. They endure because inspired by hope. Now, I want to showcase one church. This church was put in the Bible in Revelation to give a warning to us. Turn your Bibles here. Romans 2, 4. I want you to read this together. I know your deeds. God is talking to this church in Ephesus. I know your deeds, hard work, and perseverance. Is this church an active church? Yes. Amen, right? I know you. hard work, perseverance. You have persevered and have endured hardship. Is this an awesome, amazing church? Yes. Amen, somebody. God is praising them for my name and have not grown weary. Then God says, yet I hold one thing against you. You have left your first love. And sometimes, listen to me carefully, this could happen to marriage. If there is no love, you feel like just roommates. No connection. That's just why we want to keep that love burning and, 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 and motivating us because if, if love will be gone, Everything that you do will be a burden. And that's what happened to the church. But let's go back to that, go back to the first slide. Look at the first Thessalonians. Everybody say, work produced by faith, work produced by faith. labor prompted by love, prompted by endurance love. inspired by hope. And I remember the story of Mother Teresa. So we fast forward, we could go to the next, next slide. Mother Teresa was once interviewed by a journalist. Listen to what the journalist said. Pulling out, pulling dying people out of sewer? I won't do that for all the money in the world. And you know what Mother Teresa said? Neither would I. And then Mother Teresa said, I do this because I love Jesus. That's her motivation why she went there to the streets of Calcutta, India and gave her life to the slums and the poor people in India. It's not about money. It's because I do this because I love Jesus. Amen, somebody. I hope that you do your ministry at Charisma 
Because you love Jesus. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. You don't care who gets the credit, but because you love God. And that's what's happened at 1 Thessalonians. And listen to what Paul, writing a love letter to this church that he has been there for only three weeks. He says here, let's read this together, church. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, and he has chosen you. You know, I want you to say this to yourself today. Because sometimes you always hear negative from people. It gets into you. I just want you to know, just say this to yourself. I'm loved by God. Come on, say it, church. I'm loved by God. You point the person next to you. You are loved by God. And now I want you to say it to yourself. I am chosen. Come on, somebody. Say it to yourself. I am chosen. Tell the person next to you, you're chosen. You need to say that to yourself because sometimes you feel all the negativity. Remember, it doesn't matter who reject you. It doesn't matter who hated you. Just always remember you are loved by God and you are chosen. Amen? Motivated by grace. The number two, very, very important. I want you to take time. Listen to this church. The church in Thessalonica, they're mentored by great leaders. I want to ask you today, do you believe in mentorship? Do you have an up close and personal friends who will, you will allow them to see some of the skeletons in your closet without hiding? And you will allow them to go to, with you through the, what troubles you're going through in life? That's very, very important, church. Listen to what they said. Let's read this together, Charisma. You know how we live among you. For your sake... You became what? I'm doing my best to be a good role model of Jesus to you so that you will imitate me as I love God. Amen, somebody. I, I want to I be a mentor to you. I, I want to be someone who will go with you. I'm not just, this is the church, listen to me. This is not my career. Pastoring is not my job. It is my calling. It is my life. And I want to be part of your life because God called me to do this, to come alongside with you to the highs and the lows and the tough times and the moments of your life, to cry with you, to laugh with you, to, to cheer you on, to go to the mountaintop and sometimes cry with you in the valley. Amen? You know, last year, Golden State Warriors won. And defeated who? I'm sorry, Jomar. I know you're a LeBron James fan, but why are you still attending this church? We hate LeBron James here. No, just kidding. <laughs> Golden State Warriors won, right? And Steve Kerr, the head coach, was being interviewed, being getting all the credit, and then he deflected it. Would you please interview Mike Brown? How, Mike Brown is an assistant because the half of the season last year, Steve Kerr came down with a sickness he cannot coach. It was Mike Brown who kept the ship floating. And you know, I like Mike Brown. He's very humble and always teachable. And he said, how did you do it? And you know what he said? I have great mentors. And they did the research about the mentors of Mike Brown. I want you to look at the screen. Mike Brown was mentored by great Popovich of San Antonio Spurs. Greg Popovich was mentored by the great Larry Brown. Remember Larry Brown, Philadelphia? And great Larry Brown was mentored by the great Dean Smith of North Carolina. And North, Dean Smith was mentored by Forrest Fogg Allen. And Forrest Fogg Allen was mentored by Dr. James Naismith. How many of you who Dr. James Naismith? He's the one who invented basketball. He's the one who invented basketball. So Mike Brown's mentors traces all the way to the person who invented basketball. Now, I want to tell ask you today, who is mentoring you? And me as a pastor, every pastor needs a pastor. Can I show you, share some up close and personal details of my life? Uh, I'm thankful for, for pastors because... Here's the thing I want you to learn. 
if you can adopt kids, you can adopt parents too. You can adopt someone who will be a role model to you. Spiritual fathers, mentors. Yesterday, did you know that I had this awesome opportunity to preach in front of the entire network of the Service of God for the multi-ethnic conference? And for those of you who came, thank you for your support. I just, I really appreciate that. I was so nervous and excited at the same time. Because I'll be preaching in front of my pastors and colleagues and my leaders. It's just like me playing for Oh my God, I get to play basketball in front of Michael Jordan, my hero, in front of, in front of Magic Johnson. There are two great mentors in my life I want, you to, I want to introduce to you. Number one is this. Uh, can we show it on the screen? Dave and Debbie Cole. I love this couple. When, when you want to hang out with non-church people, how to hang out, these people are great. You know, they drive a Harley Davidson all over America, hang out with the Hells Angels, go to the bars, hang out with them, and bring the light of Jesus there. Great mentors. He wrote a book, What the Church Can Learn from Harley Davidson. They were there last yesterday, as we show in the screen, as we go to the next slide. They were there and uh, get... And then this is the man who turned my life around. This guy. Can you show it the screen? My boy, Dr. Don Ross. Her, his hobby is he has a big ship that every summer he'll go out, go to Canada and be, for two weeks, just stay in the boat. And that's, that's his hobby, to go fishing. He's my boss. He's the leader. He's I learned a lot from him. He was there too. Can we show it on the screen? Awesome man of God. And he... Don, Dr. Don Ross told me, James, I came early to hear you, man. Because supposedly he would come in the afternoon to preach. And I'm saying, I'm so happy to call you as one of my sons. He's not like a father to me. And the reason why I'm telling you that is you need people who mentors you. And these people that I have in my life... They can look straight me eye to eye and he will ask me, how's Sharon? He will not ask about house church, how's your family? And I can divulge to them. And you know, we need that. Paul says this, I just want to read you to this verse, church. 1 Thessalonians 2, 8, everybody read this together. Because we love you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, of, but our life. I want you to know, church, I'm not just here to preach the Bible to you. I want to share my life to you. And charisma, have I told you lately that I love you? It's not a song. I meant it. <laughs> you know, some pastors will hide their problem from the church because if they debunk their problem, the people might not respect them. I, I don't get that because I believe it, the, your members are really your friends. They will, you tell them how bad you were and they will accept you and they still love you. Amen, somebody. I never shy away from telling you stories of my family that I have my own daughter who's battling suicide tendencies. I never hide it from you guys. And sometimes the more I told stories like that, people will come up, thank you, PJ, for telling stories like that because that's what we're going through with my daughter too. That's what we're going through with my family too. Up close and personal and real. The point I'm trying to say is this. We're all in this together. We're not there yet, but we're on the right journey. Amen. Amen. And on that journey, don't travel alone. Don't travel alone. You will be burned out. Find some people. Be part of a life group. Be part of a, a small group. Accountability. And number three I like about this church is they move through obstacles. They move through obstacles. You know what happened in, in, in Thessalonica, right? The, the pastor was booted out. So imagine that. 
the Christians are being fed to the lions. I want you to read this together. You welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by Holy Spirit. Everybody, severe suffering. The word severe suffering is like you're being crushed to death. They were being literally crushed to death. They're being fed to the lions, Christians. Their pastors got booted out already. There's a price on his hand. He's going to get killed. In spite of that, the Bible says they welcome the message with joy. And this is the message what the world doesn't understand. Christians, we can go through divorce. We could go through bankruptcy. We could go hell on earth. And we'll come up still praising God, saying hallelujah with a smile on our face because of the joy of the Lord in our hearts. Amen, somebody. And that's the difference that we have because our happiness is not based on things. Our happiness is not based on what we have. Our joy is in the relationship with Jesus Christ. It's never based on happening. Amen. Go to the bar. There's called the happy hour from 7 to 9. 9.05, you're depressed again. <laughs> right? That's happiness. It's based on what's happening. That's why you have to have events. That's why you have to have programs, big parties. Because come on, let's give it up. Come on, let's make it louder. Let's bigger. And uh, just, I'm all for them. It's good. But sometimes when there's no more party, when there's no more sound, it's just you alone in your room and looking at the wall. That's where you need the joy of the Lord who is your strength that comes from the inside of you. No matter what sufferings you go through, these people, church, severe suffering. I like what Viktor Prankl said. He was incarcerated during the Nazis, Jewish believer. They took away everything. The last possession they took from him was his wedding ring. So that he will be depressed and really sad. You know what he said? Everything can be taken from a man. But one thing, the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. Don't let anyone take that from you. You have the control over your attitude. Sometimes we, a lot of people, oh, I, wrong, I, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Even the bed, you blame it. <laughs> the bed. If you ro woke up on the wrong side of the bed, you know what I tell people? Go back to bed and woke up on the right side. <laughs> right? We blame everything. Oh, this mean boss. Oh, this cut me off. Oh, this. I cannot control what people will do, but I can always control what I will say and how I react to them. Amen, somebody? And that's what this Victor Frankl say. You could, you could take everything up of me. You could kill me, but I cannot take, you cannot take, take away from my, the freedom how I would react and choose my attitude. Move through obstacles. A great example, our American icon, Colonel Sanders. Remember Colonel Sanders? Did you know that 1,009 times, look at the next slide, 1,009 times, his fried chicken recipe was rejected before a restaurant accepted it. Colonel Sanders, just three more weeks, I'll get to meet you again. <laughs> you know Colonel Sanders? I'm thinking of fried chicken right now. <laughs> so because of you, Mark. <laughs> I'm blaming. I'm not preaching what I believe in what I'm preaching. I'm sorry. Uh, let's go back to the Word of God. So, did you know Colonel Sanders is global? You go to the Philippines. They have a contest last year. The first Filipino Colonel Sanders. Ronaldo Valdez. And China, of course, they want to be outdone. You go to China, you'll see this young dude. Look at the next slide. I'm the new KFC Colonel Sanders. And the point, they became, this icon became an inspiration all over global. It's not just because of the fried chicken also, but because of the inspiration that he moved through obstacles. Charisma, I'm just telling you, it's not going to be easy, but let's move through obstacles. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. And last but not the least, you know why it's very important to move through obstacles? Tell the person next to you, you have a lot of influence. 
in the television, you have a lot of influence. People are watching you. People are watching you. And what you go through in this world, God will use you as a model for others. Last but not the least, look what happened to this church. Let's read this together. And so you became a model to all the what? The believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become what? Everywhere. For those of you who've been attending this church, I just want to let you know, just a little bit praise report. Did you know that part of the multi-ethnic conference last yesterday is to showcase to the entire network of the Assemblies of God what God is doing through charisma? Can we give a clap of praise to Jesus? Come on, church. And so our pastor friends, yeah, share, share to the American brothers what God is doing here. There's a Nigerian there, Romanian, Kenyan, African, and it's like a United Nations. So show you some pictures. I was, praise the Lord. Uh, there's a Russian pastor praying over me. Terry Peretti, who's a, an awesome missionary from Italy. He's like one of our leaders there. And then I get to preach the word of God there. And this is my proudest moment. And I literally cried when our worship team was leading worship. I'm so blessed to have a, our worship team. Amen. Charisma, you don't know what you have. You, sometimes you don't appreciate because you get used to it. You know, my, our network leader, Don Ross, said, you have this kind of worship? Is that, are, are, are you asking, are, are they all from charisma? I said, yeah. And I just told him with a little bit pride in my heart, we have that every Sunday. Wow. And then Richard, the awesome worship leader, the song that we sang composed by him, amen? Oh, thank you for that generous applause. <laughs> that is just the first song. We're gonna, I'm, I'm sharing you a prophecy. 15 years ago, when we were still this church new, the Holy Spirit spoke to me a prophecy, Isaiah 11, 61, 11. Can we put it on the screen? And I say, 61, 11, I said, what's that, Lord? He said, it's a soil that sprouts out, becomes a garden, and it grows. And the sovereign Lord comes over it. And righteousness and praise. For the soil, let's read it together. For the soil makes sprout, comes up, a garden causes, so sovereign Lord will make what? And pray spring over all? So God spoke in my heart, one day your worship team will be having a worship and it will be sang to all the nations. Amen. And while I was up there in the balcony last yesterday and I was watching the worship team, I hear God telling me, it's just like, I told you, boy. <laughs> You never believed me. And look in all the different flags of the nations. And now we're producing our own worship that will be. And they, after the after they worship, the pastors came up to me. Hey, James, do you have conferences? I don't know what's conference. We have prayer meeting, <laughs> life group. No, you should host your own conference. Share it to the world. Share it to the different nations. Share it to our people. Come on, somebody. And even our district superintendent. Do it, James. We're backing you up. Come on, do it, James. And this is what, they're see what we're seeing here. We'll come up through CDs, iTunes, and then we have our 66 a million network of assembly of God followers, believers in the network, and their net, and then that prophecy will come to pass. The soil that sprouts out, the garden to grow, sovereign Lord, make righteousness and praise will be sang all over the nation. Come on, somebody, let's give the Lord a clap of praise for that. And this is a thing I want to share to you. I was telling with my, uh, my brother Emerson today, you know, man, yesterday the worship team, my gosh, you should be proud of the worship. They rock it, man. They hit it out of the park. And Emerson is like, I, I call him like Yoda. 
you know, then Star Trek was very wise man. <laughs> and then he told me, you know, PJ, you know, our worship team, they've been, most of them, they've been through hell on earth. All of them have stories of being hell on earth. And out of that experience, they're seeing it as a worship to God. The height of your worship is determined by the depths of hell where God pick you up. Come, how many of you can say amen to that? Come on, somebody. You really appreciate that Jehovah Jireh, God, my provider, when you're almost down to nothing. Amen, somebody. You really appreciate Jehovah Rapha, God, my healer, when you are battling cancer and your life and death. Come on, somebody. You really appreciate that God, you're the resurrection and the life when you're on the brink of suicide. Come on, somebody. The height of your worship is determined by how deep God picked you up. And I can tell you, this, most of the stories of our worship, they've been through some rough times in their life. But you see them here standing and worshiping God because they will never let the devil steal the joy of God in their lives. They're going to keep praising God and keep praising God. And God will take care of that and will showcase to the nation, to the world. Now I just stand up today, Charisma. And I ask uh, Richard and worship to, to lead us again in that song. Can we pray this prayer today? Holy Spirit, immerse us with fire. Burn in our lives that needed to be taken away. So that our life will be a sweet smelling aroma of worship. You know when you go to a barbecue party, right? When you, when you burn the meat and you could smell from afar, oh my gosh, my neighbors are having a barbecue, having a tailgate, things like that, party. And you could smell the aroma. You know what God is doing in worship? It's like, like a grilling to what we've been through. And out of our pain comes worship. It's a sweet-smelling aroma to heaven. Let's send a sweet-smelling aroma to heaven today, church. Let's raise our hands. Come on, reap your hands. Don't be shy. It's just a way of saying I'm open to you, God. Hallelujah. In our darkest hours, we will never fear. For the Lord, our hero, is never out of reach. He's the hope and he's the freedom that endures. In a dying world, he's the answer and the cure. Yes, your love is our only answer and our cure. Holy Spirit. Let us shine your light You're the liberator This I can be sure You're my freedom You're my answer You're my cure We come to the altar We offer our life
the dark with our hearts lifted high. Come on. Yeah. For the Lord, our liberator, yeah. is on our side. Thank you, God. We will face the enemies and overcome. Yeah. Sing this with me. For he has the victory already won. For he has the victory already won. Holy Spirit, immerse me with fire. We long for your presence, oh Lord. Holy Spirit, immerse me with fire. Show presence is freedom. Show presence is freedom. Oh, yeah. Your presence is freedom. Prayerfully, let's sing it without the instrument. Holy Spirit, oh, it's beautiful. It's like a sweet smelling aroma to heaven. Apart from God, all of the hope that we put our life on is ultimately a dying hope. Hope is only secured in the person of Jesus. The world is being rocked left and right right now with all these devastations and and what will remain standing is God, a relationship with Him, and what we're doing to move the mission of Jesus. Would you make a covenant with God today, like a commitment? Would you, would you just like a pledge to Jesus? Would you raise your right hand or left hand, whatever you prepare to? Say this with me, dear God. I need you. I'm hopeless without you. I'm helpless without you. And in my desperation today, I surrender my life to you. Fill my life with hope so I could bring hope to this hopeless culture. Make me an agent of hope. When they go down on me, I stay above because greater is He that is in me than He that's in the world. I will move through obstacles. The devil will be my vitamins. If he attacks me, I will use it for my workout to become stronger to push through, to press on, and not to give up. The more he attacks me, the more I get bigger, the more I get stronger, because Jesus is using what the enemy meant for evil, God can turn it for my good. And I declare that the best days of my life is still ahead of me. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let's give Jesus a mighty clap of praise today, church. Come on, somebody. You can now be seated. Let's worship God. Through